right here on BBC Two Northern Ireland with scenes you may find upsetting. Spotlight. Tonight, Spotlight investigates a multi-million pounds illegal puppy trade that has its roots in Northern Ireland. For six months, we have been undercover on the trail of the local dealers sending sick and dying pups across Great Britain. The guy walking with two dogs towards us. Dealers have made a killing as demand for pups has rocketed during COVID. How much money are we talking about here? You rent tens of millions there, you know. That's what you're into. You're into an awful lot of money. To me, it's the new drugs. Um, if you come into Cairn Ryan with £20,000 worth of drugs, you're going to go to jail. £20,000 worth of pups, you'll get a £500 fine. They're moving puppies over the border and across the Irish Sea. What these people are seeing is low-risk, high-gain opportunities here to smuggle in puppies and make quick money without any thought for the people or the animals they are harming in the process. I know that you've been selling sick and dying pups across Scotland. In the fight against this illegal trade, why is Northern Ireland considered the weakest link? A 10 year old boy receives a surprise gift a new puppy. The moment is captured on his dad's phone. When I went home, I didn't actually tell him I got the dog straight away. I wanted uh, like to be a surprise, I wanted the dog to start moving, and then, like, oh, a dog is here. Yeah, I want it to be like a, make it like a drama. So he was very happy? Very excited, very happy, and I made his day. Listen, the dog is in my house. Look. In March this year, Adele Ghani bought the Labrador pup on Gumtree. Due to COVID restrictions, the seller advised him that he would have to collect the dog outdoors in a supermarket car park. Hours later, as the dog explored his new home, it became clear something was terribly wrong. Usually when you get a dog, like, uh, he's curious, walk around and turn around the house, try to explore the house. And, well, this one couldn't do that. It's just like a few steps and lay down. So you can tell he's no power. He's clearly very, very ill there. There's something uh, wrong. This smell and this uh, sleep as well. And after two hours, it was just like the breathing was uh, was not normal. Was, everything changed. The excitement turned to bewilderment and then horror. The puppy was lying motionless with foam coming from its mouth. Shocked and angry, Adele filmed a second video, this time to confront the person who had sold him the pup. Just to show you that the dog is dead. He was sick. The smell and there is something coming from his mouth. I didn't even tell my son that he's died. Until today he doesn't know. I told him it just it was something wrong that you came back. consequences. Casualties of a multi-million pounds black economy, which exploded at the beginning of the COVID pandemic as record numbers sought out a pet for companionship during lockdown. The surge in demand has seen thousands of Irish dogs shipped over to be sold. June 2020. Investigators from the Ulster Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals secretly film this exchange less than half a mile from the border in County Fermanagh. In 
In this secluded farmyard, puppies change hands. One of the things that made the USPCA suspicious about this deal is the origin of the puppies. Martin Ward of Chum, County Galway, had been observed by the investigators driving his van over the border minutes earlier, making it likely that the puppies are among the many from the Republic headed to Great Britain every year via Northern Ireland. Brian Gillen is the chief executive of the Dublin Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. He says many of the illegally exported pups flooding the UK begin life in barns and sheds in the Irish Republic. Once in Great Britain, they are advertised and sold to buyers as homebred pups. Can you put into context the scale of, of, of the illegal smuggling? The reality of this is it's maybe 25 to 30,000 puppies a year. Uh, a lot of that traffic is, is heading for the UK, UK mainland. A lot of it would go out through Northern Ireland. Once they reach Northern Ireland, effectively they're home free. We've been involved in an operation in Liverpool docks just to observe what's going on. We've seen hundreds of puppies literally coming off the ferries from Northern Ireland. How much money are we talking about here? Well, you're into tens of millions there, you know. That's what you're into. You're into an awful lot of money. The smuggling of dogs is very much in my mind linked to other criminality. You know, so whether it's drugs or firearms or whether it's it's other um, criminal activity, um, the the puppies really are the cash element in this. You know, because they're they put cash into the whole criminal system. It's organised crime. It's all about the money tight rules in the Republic of Ireland for dog breeders who want to export a pup to the UK. They have to have a pet passport, including proof of vaccination and microchipping, and prove the pup is at least 15 weeks old. But because buyers often want pups younger than 15 weeks, smugglers have a financial incentive to pass off Republic of Ireland dogs as though they were bred in the UK where eight weeks is the minimum age for sale. Back in Fermanagh, the puppies brought over the border appear to be younger than the 15-week limit. The man receiving them is David Furness, a licensed dog transporter from Greater Manchester. He appears to insert microchips into the dogs as he receives them. The deal done. Martin Ward heads back over the border. We wrote to Mr. Ward to ask about this footage, but he did not reply. The USPCA surveillance team follow transporter David Furness to Belfast Port, where he boards a ferry for Liverpool. It's what happened here in the port of Belfast that's crucially important to this story. Did David Furness declare that the puppies he picked up had come from the Republic of Ireland? And did port inspectors check the origin of the dogs and their microchip information? Those inspectors had previously been alerted to the possibility that Mr. Furness was providing incorrect information about puppies he was transporting. On two occasions, the USPCA had alerted DERA, that's the Department for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs, that Mr. Furness was intending to travel on the ferry with pups which they believed came from south of the border. We provided information on this individual to the Belfast Port Authorities. And they did stop and inspect the uh, pups that were being transported. But they took at face value the information provided by the transporter on the origin of these pups and did no further investigation as to uh, checking the bona fides of the information that the transporter uh, provided. So they just took what he said at face value. So on that basis, we lost confidence in the enforcement authorities 
and felt we had to find a different avenue to hold this individual to account. We asked Dira what checks had been done on the pups observed by the USPCA coming from the Republic. The department didn't answer directly, but said the matter is now part of an investigation. With the authorities accused of not doing enough, we began an extensive months long investigation that took us across the UK and Ireland. And one of the first things we learned is that animal protection societies in Great Britain share the concerns that Northern Ireland is a hub for trafficking pups. Operation Delphin is the multi-agency task force set up to bring those involved in the illegal puppy trade to justice across the UK and Ireland. Chief Superintendent Mike Flynn from the Scottish Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals is one of the lead officers. He believes at the heart of the illegal trade are members of a number of large, extended, Northern Ireland-based families. The majority of the problems we've been having in recent months has been with what we believe to be three families, extended families in Northern Ireland. It's quite a logistical thing to do. I mean, by the time you organise, getting the pups from Southern Ireland, getting them to your base there, organising the ferry, and getting your, all your sat-nav and your location details ready. You can meet somebody at 9 o'clock in Glasgow, and 12 o'clock in Edinburgh, and 3 o'clock in uh, Aberdeen, and then organising all the tickets. So it'd be a lot of work for one person to do. So instead, you just want the, the main target or suspect coming over. So it's somebody from that group that's coming over with the pups, um, and we've caught one of the families at least twice, um, and they were renting Airbnbs in Glasgow. We decided to follow one of the routes most travelled by pups brought through Northern Ireland, the ferry from Belfast to Cairn Ryan. These photographs were taken by SSPCA investigators during a seizure of pups at the Scottish port in July last year. Other pups don't make it to their destination alive, dying from diseases like parvovirus en route. Quite recently, there was obviously a litter of pups that didn't make it, and the, the first lay-by outside um, Cairn Ryan, they just dumped the pups, six parvo, parvo pups, and then carried on their journey, and so the remaining pups that were still alive. The pups that do survive are often held in rented accommodation, advertised online, and distributed within days. Buyers believe they are purchasing locally bred pets from a loving home, oblivious to the fact they are helping to finance organized crime. To me, it's the new drugs. Um, if you come into Cairn Ryan with £20,000 worth of drugs, you're going to go to jail. £20,000 worth of pups, you'll get a £500 fine. What laws are these people breaking? In Scotland, they would be breaking um, the Pet Animals Act, selling an animal in a public place. But more importantly, with the ones we deal with, uh, they'd be committing an offence under the Animal Health and Welfare Scotland Act 2006 because the pups are ill. And now that's whether it's a dealer or the breeder or anybody. If you sell an ill pup and it requires veterinary treatment, that is a criminal offence. We've spoken to people right across Scotland who bought pups from Northern Ireland sellers. They thought they were buying locally bred pups from loving homes. Some of the dogs died soon after purchase. Others have survived but owners have spent thousands of pounds on vet bills, keeping them pain-free and alive. In the rural beauty of Inverness, we meet Stephanie Western. She purchased a Siberian Husky cross pup on Gumtree from someone claiming to be called Paul from Falkirk. The advert seemed to tick all the boxes. The pup was vaccinated and microchipped. They said that he was a collie crossed with a Husky 
Um, my son, he's been desperate for a husky. He just wanted a husky. So we, you know, we said, okay. Half an hour later, before she was due to collect the dog, the seller changed the plan. Instead of meeting at a family home in Falkirk, Stephanie was instructed to go to a service station near Perth. Rather than meeting Paul, she would now be collecting the dog from a man with an Irish accent claiming to be his stepfather. Because of COVID, you know, we were all a little bit afraid. So meeting in an outdoor location seemed like an okay, an okay plan. When Stephanie saw the pup, she instantly fell in love. We are presented with this tiny little fluff ball that just wants to play with you and interact with you and it's kind of like, yeah, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to leave, leave it behind. But within minutes of leaving the service station, alarm bells rang when they put food in front of the dog. We brought the treats, opened the bag and he just was like a wild animal. He was like fighting to get out of my partner's arms. He was clambering over him. Um, and I was like, this dog's starving. And then came the diarrhea. And I was like, we just need to get home fast. We need to ring the vets. Um, and that's what we did. A visit to the vet confirmed the pup was severely dehydrated, infested with fleas and worms, and anemic. A blood infection was causing severe breathing difficulties. All evidence of neglect, which strongly suggests the puppy should not have been sold. We obviously felt so stupid. It was gutted that we'd handed over, you know, our hard-earned money to these people who were just abusing these little animals it was absolutely heartbroken just absolutely heartbroken by the time the next morning came he was wheezy you know kind of like an asthmatic child and both my kids have had asthma as kids so i kind of like recognized it um so that's why they put him on the antibiotics um he had five day course of that and then he seemed fine the family named him Thor, but Stephanie was horrified at what happened next. The day after finishing the course, he went downhill dramatically. He climbed up on the city and he laid down and it was like he was lying down to die. Initially, the antibiotics failed to control the infection. With mounting vet bills, Stephanie and her partner were faced with a dilemma over whether to prolong the treatment. I was just distraught, absolutely distraught. Obviously I had to have the conversation with my partner, you know, we're not made of money. You know, we've managed to save up a bit during lockdown. Um, when, when do we say, when do we say stop? Other families in Scotland were facing the same heartbreak at that very moment. This husky pup called Mooncake appears to come from the same litter as Thor, but was sold 200 miles away. He had parvovirus, worms, and secondary pneumonia, and died within 48 hours of purchase. This is Star, who was again purchased via a gum tree advert in Dundee. He had a lung and intestinal infection and died within 24 hours. The serial numbers of their microchips were closely matched, with two sequential, indicating that the three dogs were probably microchipped at the same time. But in each case, their microchips were unregistered making it impossible to trace them back to the dealer. But we have tracked him down. Bernard Ward is based in Coal Island, County Tyrone, but spends much of his time in Scotland. 
he and the Stirling base he operates out of are known to animal welfare officers. Bernard Ward regularly travels between Northern Ireland and Scotland. Evidence indicates that he's used the caravan park just behind me over those trees as one of his bases. Stephanie and four other people, all living in different parts of Scotland, have independently identified Bernard Ward as having sold them pups in person. In three cases, bank transfers were made to an account under the name B. Ward, and in one case, he used his own name in the sale. The heartbroken puppy owners find him hard to contact about their sick dogs. But in July, we get a breakthrough. We are back in Scotland after receiving a tip-off that dealers from Northern Ireland are selling pups online. One ad in particular is highly suspicious. We've been alerted to an advert that has been placed on Gumtree. Uh, it's for three Labradors in Stirling at £1,450 each. And there are just so many red flags uh, in this advert. The ad, posted by someone called Christopher, claims to offer a family-bred pup raised in a loving home. But the photographs are all taken in a park. The pups look listless. When I've asked him for an address, um, he's given me one that's incomplete. Um, I've asked him for a postcode, but he hasn't replied. The following day, we decide to go ahead with the undercover cash purchase to try to expose what is going on. 450, 1450, that's it. Yeah, we've got it. We want to get the pup checked by a vet as soon as possible after purchase. So we message Christopher again to bring the meeting time forward. Hey Christopher, would it be okay to view at 1.30? Let me know. There's always a risk that this guy's so desperate for the money that he has offloaded the pup already, but fingers crossed. So Christopher's come back, he's saying should be okay. If I can't be there, is it okay for my son? He is 18. So that is following a pattern that we've already established that it's very rarely the person you deal with in the message that comes to the to the mate. I pose as a woman living in Glasgow. I'm going to be Mary who has natural brown bulb hair. What do you think? We sent off for Sterling. Christopher hasn't given us a postcode, so we're still unsure where exactly we land up. So he's just messaging me saying, if it's easier, I can come down to you. So he wants this sale. Um, so I'm going to say, already on my way. As we approach Sterling, we are finally given a place to meet. Okay, Christopher's just messaged back. He said that his son will meet us at Bochel Community Centre. He's given us the postcode that's in the Bridge End area and that he'll bring the pup's mum and also paperwork. So we told him we'll be there in about an hour. So we're on our way now. There's a guy walking with two dogs towards us. Shortly after we arrive, we spot the seller on foot. Christopher assured us his son is 18, but we have since established this seller is actually a minor, which is why we have concealed his face. As well as the Labrador pup, the seller has also brought along a dog that he claims is the mother. 
That should reassure us that this is a legitimate sale. But later, an independent vet who saw the footage assessed the dog had no visible signs of having given birth or nursed pups recently. She also said the skin condition looked poor. And given the vaccination card for the pup. When I agree to the purchase, the seller is unable to provide a receipt and he gives us a false name. The deal is done in around 10 minutes. We hand over 1450 pounds in total. I mean, we're really fascinated we're not getting a receipt here. Before we leave, he agrees to give me an address, Bridge End Park, Stirling. Uh, okay. Alright. Thank you very much. I have been a bit here. When we take our pup away, we give her some water and notice she has a swollen tummy. We just named her in the car. This is Bonnie. Um, she, her heart is going like a train. Um, very, very nervous. Um, but um, she also has a very, very strong smell. But what a beautiful wake up. We're going to take Bonnie to the vet now and we're going to get her checked over um, and see, see how she is. Specialist vet Richard. At this stage, we have no idea what condition she's in or the state of her health. I certainly have some concerns about the situation that you've got her from. There has been offence taking place by the breeder. We shouldn't be selling puppies in a public place. There's been discrepancies in their story insofar as their name um, and in terms of um, potentially seeing mum but maybe not seeing mum. Richard also has concerns about the pup's physical health. On the face of it, we've got an under-conditioned puppy um, with a bit of a pot belly. So I suspect the lack of information about the worming is that we haven't been wormed. Okay. We've got uh, a clear discharge from the eyes, which might be that we've been in an environment where there's a high ammonia level, okay, so packed in with loads of other animals with poor ventilation, okay. So I, I do have concerns. It would be very sensible to protect ourselves from this puppy deteriorating rapidly, okay. Um, and what that would involve is us taking a wee blood sample uh, to check organ function um, and haematology, which is an indication of the inflammatory markers within the bloodstream, um, and also to take a little fecal sample. The vet named on Bonnie's vaccination paper confirmed she had received her first vaccination, but was not in the condition you'd expect of a Labrador pup. Further tests carried out by Richard established Bonnie was anemic and had two kinds of intestinal parasites, Jardia and Coccidia, conditions that make the seal illegal in Scottish law. What information do you have in terms of the chip? 
So our analysis um, found that the microchip uh, company that this should be registered to, it's not been registered. So there's no client details that we can find on this chip. So that's another major red flag with regards to the origin of this puppy. Unregistered microchips have been found in all the pups we've seen in Scotland. Bonnie has one, as did Thor, Star and Mooncake, a common characteristic of illicitly sold pups. When we reviewed our undercover footage, we recognised the teenager who sold us Bonnie. He is closely linked to Bernard Ward. It now seems the man I was communicating with at Gumtree was most likely Bernard Ward, the same man we believe was responsible for the sale of Stephanie's dog and other sick and dying pups across Scotland. It was time to put our allegations to Bernard Ward. We decided to phone him. Hello, Bernard. Are you speaking? Hi, Bernard. Um, it's it's Mandy McCauley. Um, I'm ringing from the BBC. Um, I wanted to ask you about some pups that you've been selling, Mr. Ward. Um, well, Ber Bernard, uh, Bernard has hung the, the phone up very quickly. But I'm going to try him again and see uh, if we can persuade Mr. Ward to talk to us. Bernard, Mr. Ward, it's Mandy McCauley again from the BBC. Uh, yes, um, uh, I think I think uh, I, your call dropped off there. Um, I just wanted to ask you some questions about pups that you've been selling across Scotland. I'm recording your call for broadcast, Mr. Ward. Um, I know that you've been selling. I know that you've been selling um, sick and dying pups across Scotland. Multiple testimony, multiple victims that leads back to you, Mr. Ward. Some of those pups that... No, he doesn't want to talk to me. And if he had wanted to talk to us, I would have asked him about those very serious allegations. Bernard Ward won't answer our questions. He said we got the wrong number, but it was the one he himself had used in the sale of a sick pup. And we've picked up an important clue in Scotland. All the pups we have tracked down had unregistered microchips. We took our findings to Daniela Dos Santos, a past president of the British Veterinary Association and a government advisor. She told us that unregistered microchips are a hallmark of black market pups. What is the significance of chips being unregistered? Traceability. The simple answer is traceability. So if you have a puppy that has a microchip put in it that has not been registered, you have no traceability where the puppies come from. You don't know who's bred the dog, you don't know its, its origins. And in fact, in, in the cases I'm seeing, even if you were able to trace it, they're not real origins, they're, they're fake origins. Because what's happening when we illegally smuggle puppies is that, fine, they have microchips with numbers on them, but they go across GB, Northern Ireland, spreading devastation in their wake, and there is no way to trace back who was responsible for this poor breeding. So basically, unregistered microchips enable smugglers. Yeah, unregistered microchips enable smugglers and are completely worthless when it comes to traceability. So why would puppy sellers bother to put in an untraceable microchip? Microchips are legally required for dogs boarding ferries. According to the Dogs Trust, Pups are checked for the presence of a microchip when they reach a port, but there are no checks to see if the chip is genuinely registered. That leads us back to another piece of evidence. The pups we saw having microchips injected into them at the very start of our investigation. This now looks like the exact moment Republic of Ireland pups are transformed into UK pups. With their true origins disguised, they can then be moved to Great Britain and sold at a younger age. The significance of the footage is it shows pups coming from the Republic of Ireland into Northern Ireland and being microchipped 
that presents them as a dog originating in the united kingdom which means they don't have to meet the criteria for dogs coming from southern ireland which is that those pups would be fifteen weeks old they would have to be vaccinated. so what are the advantages of microchipping those pups inside the northern ireland border? they can be transported at eight weeks old rather than fifteen weeks old which increases the profit that can be made on them. we showed the footage to daniela dos santos from having looked at that footage what red flags do you see? so the big one is the movement of these puppies across the border and they mean being microchipped on the other side of the border because they should have been microchipped before they moved there should have been paperwork before they moved out of the republic of ireland into northern ireland so that is an illegal movement there is no way from that point to demonstrate that they ever came across the border and that's what this is all about absolutely there is there is no traceability and there is no other reason to microchip them on the northern irish side of the border when they've come from the republic of ireland unless you're trying to hide the fact they came from the republic of ireland what about the age of the pups in your expert opinion these puppies it's difficult for me to be certain on their age but they certainly look quite young and when you're looking at commercial movement it also involves rabies vaccination that should be administered about 12 weeks old you then need to have a 21 day wait period before you can then move across the border that's 15 weeks old and i can't convince myself that the puppies i saw on that footage are 15 weeks old what age do you i mean could you even give an approximation of their age i i would guess somewhere between eight maybe 12 weeks certainly i would not put them at 15. the man injecting the microchips is david Burness, a licensed dog transporter from greater manchester already suspected by the uspca of transporting republic of ireland pups and providing false information about their origin he becomes the focus of our investigation we decide to put him under our own surveillance on seven occasions okay that's him he's on the inside lane on the road into Newry. he travels to northern ireland as a licensed dog transporter with a well-equipped van and he makes trips that seem straightforward He's pulled in again, pulled in at a country lane. But we notice he has a number of meetings in places you might not expect to find dogs, like service stations. He's taking a left into the garage. And under a motorway bridge. The two cars have gone down under the bridge, a pan the more roundabout on the lock side. USPCA surveillance identified David Furness as transferring pups at the Lisburn service station on a previous occasion, using parked lorries as cover. When he next pulls into the service station with his van, we are already parked up in a country lane, parallel to the lorry park. Our cameras have a direct line of sight to his vehicle. Within minutes, a white car arrives with Republic of Ireland registration plates, and he takes delivery of two Spaniel pups. Okay, there's the pups lifted. There's the first one out. Second pup in now. The business is done. The pups have been handed over. They arrived here in a car with Irish Republic number plates. The question is, where did those pups come from and where are they going now? Back across the Irish Sea, the flow of illicit puppies is continuing, despite some successes from the authorities. In August, 13 people were convicted in England for being part of an Irish puppy smuggling ring from Armagh. That same month, Scottish investigators found these pups in the back of an Irish registered van left overnight outside a hotel. The pups carried the same parasites that infected the pup we bought in Scotland. This man, Martin Christopher Lawrence from County Dublin, 
was found to have false paperwork with the pups. He was placed on Operation Dolphin's illegal puppies watch list and warned that he would be prosecuted if he brought sick pups into Scotland again. But reports of Northern Irish dealers selling pups in Scotland keep coming. This time near Aberdeen. We're travelling in an SSPCA police convoy. We're on our way to a property on the outskirts of Aberdeen. Intelligence coming through that they're selling and distributing very sick and dying pups. On arrival, SSPCA investigators and police search for evidence. While the suspects are questioned, a number of dogs are found at the back of the house. At the entrance to the living room, we discover one spaniel pup lying on the floor. The SSPCA investigators prioritise getting the sickest pups to emergency care. What kind of state somebody pup in? This pup's really poor me, it's quite collapsed. It's not got any energy or anything, so we need to get it to the vet, basically, immediately. What are the chances this wee one will survive? We won't know until we figure out what's going on with the vet. In total, three pups and three adult bitches are seized from the property, one of which is pregnant with pups. The suspects, from Northern Ireland, are questioned under caution and await legal action. We later find out the Spaniel pup has survived and is in SSPCA care after emergency intervention for a parasitic condition. The raid is a minor victory in the fight against a multi-million pounds illegal trade, but it won't stop the flow of puppies still coming through Northern Ireland's ports. The puppy trade in Scotland, I would say 90% of all problems come through Belfast. Considering last year we seized over 150 pups, and at least 90% of them came over from Belfast. Whether they were bred in Northern Ireland or Southern Ireland, that's the route they came through. The DSPCA's Brian Gillen says that in recent years the Irish Port Authorities have stepped up their efforts to stop the flow of pups into Great Britain. But he says Northern Ireland is now an open gateway for criminals. It's the weak link because of the lack of legislation and the lack of inspection in Northern Ireland. Um, frankly, it's just not there at the ports in the North, the inspection level. One of the things we saw out of Brexit was effectively there was a, a border down the early sea and we had hoped that that would create a greater inspection for the purposes of animal welfare. That's that's all being suspended at this point. As things stand now, there's effectively free movement between Northern Ireland and, and the mainland UK. We wanted to interview Dearer Minister Edwin Putz about our investigation, but instead he gave us a statement. He said, it is not possible nor practical to stop every vehicle moving through Northern Ireland's ports but he said multiple interceptions have been made in recent months, including 10 Springer Spaniel pups seized last month. We needed to find out more about the movement of dogs through the ports. This time, we are following David Furness as he leaves Dublin port in his van. Tucked in behind David Furness, at a safe distance, it looks as if he's headed for Cabin and then on towards the north. But before any pups have been collected, Mr. Furness makes an unexpected turn off the motorway, bringing our surveillance to an abrupt halt for the day. We're on the way back to Belfast, we're going to regroup and we're going to head back down first thing in the morning to try and pick him up from there. Another example of just how unpredictable this is. We prepared 
to travel back to Cavan early the next morning. But David Furness has other plans. In the middle of the night we learn that he's left the accommodation he stayed in and is already travelling north. It's dark and we're now playing a game of catch up. It's just after 5 o'clock in the morning, about an hour ago, we were alerted to the fact that David Furness was on the move along the back country roads of County Cavan, just near the border. We believe that he's made one stop and that he's now on his way to Clocker in County Tyrone. After stopping off at a farm complex near Dona, just north of the border in Fermanagh, we spot him taking a break at a service station in Clocker. It's now just before 6am and we suspect he's hurrying to catch the morning ferry from Belfast to Liverpool. But further up the M1, Mr Furness once again turns into Lisburn service station where he parks his van out of sight behind a row of lorries. A large red van with Republic of Ireland number plates drives in behind him. It looks like they're about to do a transfer of pups. It's raining, and with no view through the lorries, the only chance we have of capturing the transfer on camera is to drive past them at close range. As we pass the two vehicles, we catch a glimpse of the exchange. The doors are open, and it appears as though David Furness is lifting the pup from the red van into his own. We glimpse another pup, its legs dangling in mid-air as it is transferred between the two vehicles. During our surveillance of Mr Furness, we did not observe him picking up pups in the Republic of Ireland. But this is the third time cameras have captured pups being transferred to David Furness's transporter from vehicles registered in the Republic of Ireland. Before reaching Belfast Port, David Furness stops briefly at another service station. Welcome to the shop. Yes, yes. And we have seconds to record through the back windows of his van. From the darkness, we can clearly hear the high-pitched squeal of pups. We next observe David Furness driving into the Dera Department of Agriculture building to get sign off for his cargo of pups. We know that he is required to submit a detailed log of his overnight pickups, but has he informed Dera that he collected pups from a Dublin registered red van in a service station forecourt hours earlier? We follow him onto the morning Liverpool ferry where we spot the same red van driving on as a passenger vehicle. This is strange behaviour. The driver of the red van handed David Furnas dogs to take onto a ferry. He was boarding himself. It will be another eight hours before we find out what the two men's plans are on the other side. Finally, we reach Liverpool, where our dog transporter doesn't waste any time disembarking. David Furness was one of the first off the ferry with his load of pups. He's now on the M56, heading southwards towards Manchester, and we're following him. He turns off the motorway into Chester Services and drives to the back of the lorry park. Minutes later, the red van arrives, parking close by. Are they about to transfer pups? They seem to hesitate and are on the move again. 
minutes later, the convoy turns off the motorway again. This time, to an even more secluded spot. Stop here, stop here, stop here, stop here. By the time our camera is trained on the two men, what we suspect to be a lightning quick transfer of pups is almost over. We see them running back to their vehicles with David Furness heading back to his base near Manchester and the red van heading off towards Birmingham. This red van looks like an important new lead. Why did its driver need David Furness to transport pups to the same place he was heading himself? The answer comes when we realize we've seen this van before. This is the van the SSPCA found in the middle of the night containing sick pups outside a hotel in Scotland in August. And the man then placed on an illegal puppy watch list, Martin Christopher Lawrence from County Dublin, was the same man handing puppies to David Furness in Lisburn services and meeting up with him again near Chester just weeks later. We showed that footage to our independent expert too. What would be the advantage of the man in the red Peugeot van, uh, who we know is a puppy dealer, uh, using a licensed dog transporter uh, to take his pups over to, to England? It's likely to be acting as a smoke screen because you're going to trust a licensed transporter. You know, there is a degree of trust there. You're licensed, you understand what's required. There'll probably be a degree of trust there from the authorities that this gentleman will only do things properly. So it's just a facilitation. It, it's low risk for everybody involved. I see no good reason why puppies should be handed over in a service station to just be handed back. We wrote to Martin Christopher Lawrence and tried to speak to him at two addresses he is known to use in Dublin to ask him why he was moving puppies only weeks after being warned by the SSPCA. He has not responded. We asked David Furness if he was aware Mr Lawrence had been warned in Scotland and if he submitted Mr Lawrence's details when he brought the puppies onto the Liverpool ferry. He did not answer these or any of our other questions, but responded through a solicitor who said we had made serious allegations based upon a total absence of credible evidence. The solicitor said Mr. Furness is carrying on a legitimate business which is totally compliant with the current legislation. One outstanding question is whether Northern Ireland will continue to be used as a gateway for the illicit puppy trade. Our preferred option would be authorities in Northern Ireland searching the vehicles, stopping them getting on the boat. If they don't get on the boat, they can't be coming into Scotland. Um, and we've made, through Operation Delphin, we've made every attempt to that, but they've got short staff, all this kind of stuff. Have you approached the authorities, the port authorities, the government in Northern Ireland? A lot of it is just they do not have the resources to do it, given the volume of traffic that goes through the ports. Dear Minister Edwin Putz told us, more can and must be done to stop the illegal movement of animals, but his department does not have the resources to police an open border. He said his department will do all it can to deter the trade in puppies and said his officials are working with local councils, the PSNI, the Harbour Police and ferry companies to identify suspect movements through the ports. No dog owner, he said, should have to see their pet suffer because it has been treated like a commodity and bred purely to line the pockets of lawbreakers. Bonnie, the pup we bought in Stirling, is one of the survivors of this black economy. She has now been successfully rehomed with a dog-loving family in Scotland and is now part of a pack with two other family dogs. Thor, the pup we last saw fighting for breath, also survived. Stephanie spent thousands of pounds to make sure he lived. She says much more needs to be done 
to stem the flow of pearly bread pups into Great Britain. How is it so easy for people to just hop on a ferry with a load of sick dogs and just scam people? Like, that is something that really needs to change. That is something that, you know, needs to be addressed. Everybody wants a dog at the moment and it's an emotional purchase. And what these people are seeing is low risk, high gain opportunities here to smuggle in puppies and make quick money without any thought for the people or the animals they are harming in the process. But what they do know is that even if they're caught, the consequences are so low compared to if they're successful, which it's quite clear they are being successful and the financial rewards that they get for it. We are flooding the market with poorly bred puppies that will have, at the very least, a poor start in life and the very worst, lifelong suffering due to their poor breeding. It's an absolutely tragic story and something that we all need to take seriously. Last month, Scotland and Wales brought into effect outright bans on the sale of puppies and kittens by anyone but the breeder. That makes Northern Ireland the only part of the UK without a ban on such sales by third parties, like some of the dealers we've investigated tonight. Dear Minister Edwin Putz told this programme he supports a ban here. Legislation is being drafted for a private member's bill, but has not yet been introduced. Those measures should hurt puppy farmers, but the networks we've exposed tonight are so extensive and so lucrative that it is unlikely we will soon see an end to the trade in sick and dying dogs.